People will continue to trust the system until they're given a reason to not trust. And for that, we can't be angry at those who think differently. First and foremost, no matter which side you think you're on, this episode is for you. During these times where humanity feels so divided and so fractured, it's important for us to be able to come together and to listen to each other's stories and experiences without attachment to an outcome. In this episode, I share my personal story with the medical system. Tune in and learn why we mustn't blame individual doctors or nurses, why healthcare is really just sick care, who's really funding our medical system, the importance of sharing stories despite the fear of censorship, and how we can truly begin healing our collective. Now, if you want to dive into conversations like this, I invite you to join me in my Telegram community, the Awake and Aware community. Just head to rubyframon.com forward slash Telegram to join. If you consider yourself a leader, I invite you to grab a copy of my book, Potent Leadership. It's available on Amazon and Audible. Just head to Potent Leaders or sorry, potentleadership.com and grab your copy today. And if you've already gotten a copy off of Amazon or Audible, please do me a favor and leave a rating and review as these ratings and reviews help get the book out to more leaders around the world. Now, whether you are a loyal listener or brand new to this podcast, please take a moment to download a few episodes and drop a rating and review on iTunes. Every single download rating and review helps me get this podcast out to more listeners around the globe. Now, it is time for us to talk about our medical system and why I don't trust it. Beyond the narrative, underneath the veil of illusion, and deep within your center, therein lies potent truth. Welcome to Potent Truth where today's leaders, change makers, and light carriers come together to question the narrative, arrive at potent truth, and lead with sovereignty. What is potency? It's who you are beneath the masks, facades, and protective gear. It's the medicine humanity yearns for, cries out for, prays for, and needs. Your potency is what sets you apart, magnetizes your following, and creates movements. Join me, Ruby Fremont, for weekly guidance, channeled messages, and potent conversations that will take you on a journey of self-discovery. I am here to guide you to a place of unraveling the programming that's been keeping us stuck for generations, unlocking potent truth and expressing it through sovereign leadership. It's time for change. It's time for potent truth. Hey leaders, and welcome to another episode of potent truth. Now this one, this one I'm feeling is going to be a little heavy. And for some of you listening, it it may even trigger you to reflect on your own experiences. So for that reason, I would love to start this episode off by just taking some deep breaths together, taking some nice deep inhales through your heart center and exhaling fully. Breathing consciously and intentionally in and through your heart. Just finding that spaciousness within your heart center. The space of compassion, of love, of empathy. The space where we are truly connected to one another. And just give yourself permission to drop fully into your heart 
as you continue to listen to this week's episode. Because this truly is what we need in our world right now. Our world is feeling more fractured than ever. We are being pitted against one another. And so many of us on all sides of the equation are playing into this divide and are even increasing the amount of fractures within humanity right now. It's important that we remember who we are, who we be, and that we are all truly connected to one another. This above all else is crucial for us to remember each and every single day. And as I dive into this week's topic, which is why I don't trust the medical system, as I dive into this topic, if at any point in time you feel triggered, just get curious about your triggers. If at any point in time I share something that you disagree with, just know that that's okay. My intention with this podcast and all forms of content that I share isn't to persuade you to think like me. It's to invite you to think for yourself. It's to invite you to get curious and remain in that curiosity. It's to invite you to drop into your heart space, not your mind chatter. And reconnect with your truth. So as I dive in to this episode, please know that everything I'm sharing is from my own personal experience and I am not sharing to convince you of anything. I'm just sharing to share my personal experience as millions of other people around the world are attempting to do, yet being canceled, shamed, and shunned. I mean, since when have we become a, a collective that shames people or cancels people for thinking differently? This is the fracture that I'm referring to. So just continue to breathe, continue to remain in your heart center. And let's dive into this week's conversation on why I don't trust the medical system. Now, I say medical system for a reason. This isn't about the individual doctors or nurses that are within the system. This is about the system itself. I actually have a lot of love and compassion for the doctors and nurses that are in this system. I also have a lot of respect for the doctors and nurses that have chosen to exit this system during this time because that takes great courage. So what is this system that I'm referring to? Well, the system is built on money. It's a business. Our healthcare system is really a medical system that is really a business that fills the pockets of many people in the background that you may not even be aware of. Insurance companies, for example. Just think about how much you pay for medical insurance. Now, as a Canadian, living in the U.S. now since 2013. You know, up until 2013, I had free health care because I lived in Canada. Now, I will say the free health care system doesn't come without its, um, its troubles. <laughs> it's not the best system. And uh, in the U.S. where healthcare is, is one of the most expensive in all the world. 
it's the insurance companies that are pocketing your cash. You know, you pay hundreds of dollars each month just in case, right? Just in case something happens. And just in case something happens, if that just in case situation actually happens, then you'll save a few bucks. But where does the rest of that money go? And then we talk about pharmaceuticals. That in itself is a billion dollar industry. This is not hidden secret information, nor is this a conspiracy theory. It's really easy to look this up. Pharmaceuticals is a billion dollar industry, billions upon billions. So these are really important things to understand because the medical system is paid for by pharmaceuticals, by insurance companies. There's so much money tied into this. And with the money comes agreements, right? Pharmaceuticals, whenever there's a new drug on the market, that is the drug that doctors are encouraged to push for money. This is how they receive money. Just think about that. Now, let's talk about the medical system and the people in it. So we as a society, we have been trained our entire lives to obey authority, to trust authority, and to trust authority without question. This begins as, as children, you know, we're taught to obey our parents and, and in many cultures, anyone who is older than us. We're trained to obey and automatically trust someone in a uniform because they're in a uniform without question, whether it's doctors, nurses, police officers, whatever it is, this is how we're trained. And in a society that is healthy, this wouldn't be an issue, but our society isn't really healthy because with this training, this training to obey and trust authority, we've also been trained to not trust ourselves. So we have a society that doesn't trust themselves, a society of human beings who don't trust themselves, who don't trust their physical vessels, who don't trust themselves and their inner knowing. But at the same time, they've been programmed to trust authority. And to be honest, why would we not trust them? Why would someone not trust the authorities? We always trust until we're given a reason not to trust when it comes to the people in uniform, when it comes to the authorities, we trust until we're given a reason not to trust. I want you to keep that in mind when you question people who may feel different than you. We trust until we're given a reason not to trust. So this authority, this comes with built-in trust. And this medical system Uh, This system was positioned as a system to really keep us safe, to keep us healthy, to honor our well-being. That's how we've, what we've been raised to, to know. That the medical system is there to keep us safe, to keep us healthy. So I want you to keep all these things in mind as I continue to share more of my personal experience with regards to why I don't trust the medical system. So again, I was raised in Canada, home of free healthcare, which sounds amazing. And it is the most abused system in the entire world. In my, in my personal opinion, people go to doctor's offices for basic colds and then they're prescribed antibiotics and all sorts of shit right? This is how the system makes money. People go to the hospital for the stupidest shit. Like I'm telling you the stupidest shit. This is why the doctor's offices in Canada are always full. I don't remember ever going to the doctor's office where there were less than 10 people in the waiting room. 
And I would go to the hospital to the doctor's office a lot because I was frequently really sick. Now, what we didn't know at the time was a lot of, uh, a big reason why I kept getting sick was because I was consuming dairy, which I am actually highly allergic to, not sensitive. This is not an, an, a food sensitivity. This is a full-blown allergy. I was born allergic to dairy. Now, my mom couldn't nurse me. Dairy milk didn't work. And at that time, early 80s, there weren't any milk alternatives other than soy milk. I couldn't even drink goat milk. And so I was raised for the first four years of my life on genetically engineered soy milk. And then at age four, without doing any more testing, they just reintroduced dairy, therefore completely shutting down my gut biome, therefore completely shutting down my immune system, which is why I was a very sickly child. I had colds often, I had flus often, I had fevers often, I had stomach issues every single day of my life. And I was in and out of the doctor's office all the time, all the time. And I just remember my doctor always prescribing me medicine. It would never be over the counter stuff. It would always be something in a bottle. It would always be antibiotics or some sort of concoction just on and off medicine and antibiotics throughout my childhood without really digging into the root cause of why I was such a sickly child. Later on in my life, in my teenage years, there was a diagnosis of IBS, which a huge majority of our population has been diagnosed with, continues to be diagnosed with, again, with no digging into the root cause. I was put on prescriptions for my stomach, basically a Band-Aid effect. And no one dug into the root cause again, but at that time I didn't have a reason to not trust. So I just took the pills, continued on my way, continued eating what I was eating, continued consuming dairy, which I was highly, highly allergic to continued shutting down my gut biome, therefore shutting down my immune system. Now at the age of 20, I experienced the biggest trauma in my life. And by the age of 21, I was a newlywed. I'd just gotten married and my health was in shambles. I mean, I was in pain, physical pain, like immense physical, physical pain every single day that made it really tough to just get out of bed. I was spiraling. My entire body hurt. I was completely inflamed. My entire body was suffering from inflammation, both on the interior and exterior. So I went to see a bunch of doctors who sent me to a bunch of specialists where I was eventually diagnosed with PTSD, clinical depression, anxiety disorder, rheumatoid arthritis, and fibromyalgia at the age of 21. I'm telling you, I my health was completely shattered. I could barely function. Now at that time, I was given a cocktail of five, five different prescriptions to counteract the PTSD, the clinical depression, the anxiety, the rheumatoid arthritis, and the fibromyalgia. All five of those prescriptions had came or came with their own set of side effects. And again, none of these doctors, none of these specialists asked me about my life. No one asked what was going on in my life. And at that time I was going through the pits of hell, dealing with trauma that just wasn't being addressed. So of course my body's going to shut down. Of course, my emotional body is going to shut down. Of course, my mental body, my spiritual body, all of these bodies are going to shut down because here I am at 21 experiencing the biggest, deepest trauma of my life. And what does the medical system do? It labels me with a bunch of different diagnoses and gives me a cocktail of five different prescriptions. This is when my addiction really began. 
I became addicted to one of my prescriptions, which was Ativan. You've probably heard of it. Some of you may still take it. I mean, to this date, doctors prescribe Ativan for stupid shit like sleeping. Struggling with your sleep? Take some Ativan. What a lot of people don't understand is Ativan is a benzo and benzos can be highly addictive. They wreak havoc on your mind, body, and spirit. So at the age of 21, I became addicted to Ativan, to my benzos, and I would pop those things like candy. Just take one out, put it under my tongue, let it dissolve, and go to that place of feeling completely numb, which was so much better than feeling everything else that I was feeling. Now, because I wasn't getting to the root cause, because I wasn't really addressing my trauma and I was simply numbing it, this led me down a very dark path. And by the age of 22, I attempted suicide. And I attempted suicide by taking an entire bottle of Ativan and chasing it with half a bottle of liquor. I remember waking up to my, my then husband, my former husband, shaking me awake. And the first thought in my mind was, shit, this didn't work. So that was my experience at the ripe age of 22. And to add to this, like no one ever questioned how many times I was getting my Ativan refilled. Ativan, you're only supposed to take it when you have an anxiety attack or when you're feeling an anxiety attack, come on. It's the just in case pill that you just keep on hand all the time. And I was popping that like candy multiple times a day. And no one ever asked me why I was getting so many refills. Now, by the age of 23, shortly after my suicide attempt, I took that as a blessing, as a sign that, okay, I'm meant to live. Let me figure this shit out. And I remember looking at the newspaper and seeing an ad for a naturopath doctor in the neighborhood. And I had never heard of naturopathic care, but it was holistic. And something in me was like, yes, yes, this is what you need. So at the age of 23, I started seeing a naturopath and this naturopath at that time helped wean me off of my cocktail of prescriptions, which you have to do very carefully and very slowly and introduced me to the world of supplements, the world of whole real foods, the world of food sensitivities. And I started to take control of my well-being. Now at the age of 26, I experienced another trauma and that was when I got divorced. And that divorce led me on this journey. Now, mind you, at this point, I still have not worked on my trauma and I'm adding to that trauma now. All I know is how to numb. And although I did take back control of my well being because I was never invited to look at the root cause or never shown the way, I reverted back to numbing, but in a different way with alcohol. Because, you know, at the age of 26, newly divorced, alcohol feels fun, right? but my alcohol consumption was out of control. But again, it was all I knew to numb the pain that no one supported me in uncovering. Now at the age of 27, my addiction spread to recreational drugs and alcohol. And that's when I was doing just a routine breast exam at home in my bathroom in my little apartment. And I found a lump in my breast. And I remember that fear in my gut, just a pit in my stomach, like, oh my God, just found a lump in my breast. 
Now, because I lived in the world of free healthcare, AKA Canada, I had to wait seven months to get an ultrasound and biopsy. See, this is the reason why free healthcare isn't that great. They place you on lists in order of priority. So sometimes you just have to wait a really long time. And those seven months that I was waiting, I was just dripping with anxiety, fearing the worst. Then I went in for my ultrasound. They suggested the biopsy, did the biopsy. And it was inconclusive. Great. Okay. So we don't have an answer. (laughs) But instead, instead of just like letting it be, because who knows, it could be totally benign. They scared me into a surgery saying that, you know, what if this is cancer? This could be cancer. You could lose a breast. You could die. So of course the 27 year old me is going to say, yes, yes, please give me, give me the surgery. Cause at this point I still trusted the medical system. So a few months later I go into surgery. What was not told to me is that this would be a learning experience for student doctors and my surgery I was only under local anesthesia, so I was awake. So here I was, 27 years old, freaked out, scared for my life. They drape a curtain sort of thing at the top of my breast so I can own, I can't see past, I can't see what they're doing. And my hospital bed is surrounded by student doctors. I, I like surrounded, completely surrounded student doctors, all looking at my bare breasts. It was traumatic. I remember laying there and and tears coming down my face, not because of the surgery, because I felt so exposed. Why wasn't this information shared with me? Why didn't I know that this would be a learning opportunity for students? Why wasn't this an option for me? So the surgery went on and of course they pull out the tiny little tumor and it's benign. Great. Okay. Again, still trusting the medical system. Now at the age of 30, this is in 2012, I hit rock bottom. And this is the rock bottom that I talk a lot about in my book. I hit rock bottom. And at this point I am a full blown addict. Like I am so heavily addicted to cocaine and alcohol that it just consumes my entire life. I hit rock bottom and I realize, you know, I do have a choice. I'm just making all the wrong choices. So I start to choose differently as an attempt to rebuild my life in a different way, in a better way. I started therapy at this point in time and traditional therapy. It was okay. You know, it, it offered me a space to really share what I was feeling and what I was going through. However, there was such a major lack of understanding between me and the therapist, mostly because of the culture that I had been raised in. And she had no concept of that whatsoever. So it really just became this place for me to go dump my feelings and come back out. That was also where I was put on antidepressants again, you know, the, the, (laughs) the pills that I had spent so many years weaning off of here I am again with what they deem a low dose pitched as a solution to all my problems. So I get on the antidepressants again, and and for the next year and a half, I'm hovering at rock bottom, and I end up, and I talk about this in my book, but I'll share it again. I end up, of course, at an after hours event after I finished work at the nightclub, and I'm super high, 
I faint. I hit my head first on the concrete so hard that the music in the club stops and my entire body feels like it's shattered into a million pieces. I was completely passed out. And when I woke up, my body, I couldn't move a finger. Eventually, I was peeled off the floor. I did, I did not want to go to the hospital because I was so scared of um, being labeled as an addict. Didn't want my parents to know. So I was taken home and ended up going to the hospital a couple of days later, diagnosed with a concussion and post-concussion syndrome. And back in the system, you know, so I was diagnosed with post-concussion syndrome. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's when the symptoms of a concussion last longer than 24 hours. My symptoms lasted for almost two months. And it's interesting because unless you've had a concussion before, it's really hard to understand the, the, the depth of how horrific this experience really is. I could not, I could barely put words together. I slipped into a manic depressive state, manic depressive, meaning barely being able to say two words without crying and not knowing what I was crying about. Very, very confused. I had to be put on leave from work. Um, Everything gave me a migraine, uh, sound, light. So I would just lock myself up in my apartment in the dark. There was no aftercare given to me, by the way. It was like, oh, you had a concussion and oh, you have post-concussion syndrome. Great. No scans were done. Just sent me home and that, that was it. The pain was so severe and it lasted for so long that they ended up sending me to a neurologist and that's where they found nerve damage in my brain and they put me on nerve medication. Now the nerve medication was really fucking intense. However, about a week and a half into it, I started to regain control of my mind again. And it felt like all the synapses in my mind, like just rewired. And that was the beginning of the new me. Like I was like, this was God knocking me over for a reason. I need to take back control of my life and of my well-being. Very shortly after this is when Kevin and I got together. And then shortly after that, at the age of 32, I moved to LA. This was also the beginning of my journey with sobriety. I stopped doing drugs first, thinking that was the problem, and eventually stopped drinking, realizing that I had a much bigger issue. I started working with a naturopath again after I moved to LA and took back control of my well-being, started weaning off the, the antidepressants, started getting back into supplements, started getting back into my health regime, and got married at the age of 33. Now, at this point in time, I, I'm starting to doubt. I'm starting to doubt the medical system. You know, something doesn't feel right. I always end up back at the naturopath. I always end up back at my sup- all my supplements and, and eating healthy. And that seems to work a lot better than just popping pills. But at the age of 34, and this was in 2015, I started to feel really sick. Now, again, there was some stuff going on in my personal life that definitely um, created some struggle at, at this stage in my life, but I was suffering with a lot of gut issues that were inexplainable. Um, and, oh, let me back up actually. So I moved to, I moved to LA in 2013, 2014 was the official move, like the green card move. And in order to move from Canada to the U S get this, In order to move from Canada to the U.S., you have to get vaccinated. And the vaccines that were required included the chicken pox vaccine. What the fuck? I I tried everything to get out of it. I had to get the chicken pox vaccine. I had to get the flu vaccine. I tried everything in my power to get out of it, but this was a mandatory requirement. I had to go through like an immigration uh, specialty doctor. So I got all these vaccinations. And, And at this point in time, in my healing journey, at this point in time, 
I had healed all my gut issues. IBS gone. Like I had healed a lifetime of gut issues. So I moved to LA at the age of 33, got married. And then at 34, started feeling really, really sick. I had nausea every day. That was so intense that all I could fathom eating would be like a piece of bread or crackers. My naturopath suspected that perhaps um, we should, there could be something going on in my womb because these symptoms can also be womb related. So she suggested that I get some ultrasounds. That's when I got some ultrasounds and they found a tumor on my ovary and some fibroids in my uterus. Now, in regards to the vaccines that I mentioned, I didn't really make this connection until much later, but when I moved to LA is when my IBS came back. And I, you know, I, I was like, oh my God, is it the, the water that's different? Is it the meat that's different? Let me try being vegan and plant-based. Like I tried everything, but my IBS was back. So I'm just sharing that because there seems to be a definite connection between my gut health and these vaccinations that were forced upon me. So back to age 34, ultrasounds, tumor on my ovary, fibroids in my uterus. So of course, at the age of 34, my husband and I are trying to have kids and I really wanted kids at that time. So of course I'm scared, you know, I'm freaked out. My naturopath had to pass me on to my medical doctor who I, I, really to this day, still appreciate her and love her. I, she was a great doctor that I happened to find in LA. She had to refer me to an OBGYN and she referred me to someone in my network because I was paying insurance and I needed to go to someone within my network. And so I go to this OB and he's like, and like I shit you not, he's like 70 years old and you know, no, no judgment against age. However, things start to happen around that age that, I don't know, there were some questionable, looking back, there were some questionable behaviors, um, but at that point in time, I was really fucking scared. So I was operating out of fear. This OBGYN, this gynecologist says to me, he says, that, you know, there's, I would never allow one of my patients to live with a tumor on her ovary. We have to remove it because it will grow. And at some point it will twist your ovary and we'll have to remove your ovary. And then you're only going to have one ovary, which is going to cut your chances of having kids. This is what was told to me. Now I am in deep fear state. I am wanting to have kids. I'm freaked out. So of course I say yes to get the surgery. Now the surgery was scheduled for December, 2015. And I am super fucking healthy at this point. You know, like uh, we realized that there was a bunch of food sensitivities that were contributing to me not feeling that great. So we cut that out. So I was feeling a lot better and I was running up and down the Santa Monica stairs. Anyone in Southern California knows what this is with my husband. We did this often. And all of a sudden, as I'm running up the stairs, I feel something pop in my chest. And by the time I get up the stairs, I kind of, I have this like taste, this metallic taste, like of blood in my mouth, not bleeding, but I can taste it. And I tell Kevin, I'm like, I think we should go home. So we go home and I'm feeling like something in my chest that day. And then it progresses to like a congestion. And then by the next day, I am like unable to get off the couch, barely can breathe, coughing, So I go to my doctor, I get an emergency appointment because my surgery is like later that week. So, and this is like, this happens after I get all my testing done to clear me for surgery, which included a scan of my lungs. Okay. This is like a week after that lung scan. So my doctor sees me and she, she's like, you have pneumonia. 
and she's in shock. Like she is shocked. How did this happen? We just had all these medical clearance tests done last week. So I go home. I have full-blown pneumonia. I treat it with some antibiotics, of course. And my naturopath also has me breathing garlic in a nebulizer, which is fucking gross unless you love garlic. And I, I spend the next few weeks healing from pneumonia. Now, at this point in time, of course, I am starting to question the surgery. Because here I am with full-blown pneumonia that seemingly came out of nowhere, which feels like my body is trying to tell me something. My body's trying to tell me, don't do this surgery. So I have another checkup with my OB and I tell him, you know, I'm feeling like maybe I shouldn't get the surgery. And again, the same speech. I would never let any of my patients live their lives with this tumor on their ovary because it will grow. It will, it will, I can't remember what he was saying, twist your ovary and then we'll have to remove your ovary and you'll only have one working ovary, which will cut your chances of having a child. So back into fear mode, surgery rescheduled for January, January, 2016. The surgery. Now this is like a, a day surgery in and out is what I'm told. So I go in and I come out. I don't remember a damn thing. I remember Kevin wheeling me kind of into the car and like place picking me up and trying to put me in the car. I remember being at home and trying to go to the bathroom unsuccessfully. I remember bleeding. I remember just bits and pieces because one, they released me under the, while still under the effects of anesthesia, which they should not do. And two, I was given way too much anesthesia. So the next couple of days I dealt with difficulty breathing. It literally felt like someone was sitting on my chest, um, confusion, and difficulty using the bathroom. There was just so much anesthesia in my body that I really didn't regain feeling until a couple days later. So I was on my healing journey from this surgery. Then my stitches get infected. I have this super long recovery time. And all, all to say, I mean, that tumor, <laughs> that, that cyst, the teratoma was benign. So here I am reflecting like, huh, this feels like another unnecessary surgery that I just went through, that I just put my entire body through. So a few months later, I began working with a medical medium um, trained facilitator who took me on an eight month detox journey where I only ate fruits and vegetables, no fats, no carbs, no, no nothing. It was just literally fruits and vegetables mostly raw, um, and tons of heavy metal detox supplements, as well as magnet therapy and all sorts of things to just detox from that experience. I was so desperate to take back control of my health and well-being after what felt like another traumatic surgery. So I go on and, and life is good and I'm super healthy. I'm feeling vibrant. And then in 2018, I start to, well, 2017, I started to feel kind of like the, the spirit of depression coming back into my life, but every now and then, and 2018 became really tough where two weeks out of every month, I just couldn't function. I was dealing with deep depression, deep anxiety that came out of nowhere, suicidal thoughts, brain fog, memory loss, but only two, 10 to 14 days out of every month. And my naturopath, you know, she's like, I think this might be PMDD. And it seemed to line up. Unfortunately, there's no testing for it or anything. It's just this is what it could be. Um, your cycle seems to line up with what you're experiencing. 
Now, m- the medical system was telling me the only way to deal with this is to be put back on antidepressants or put back on birth control. And I was like, no way, no fucking way am I going back to that at this stage in my life. And that was when the call to ayahuasca became really loud. So I sat in my very first ayahuasca journey in December, 2018 in a teepee in the Santa Monica mountains. And that is when my journey with plant medicine really began. The next month, January, I sat in another ceremony. And in that ceremony, I was introduced to combo medicine. And I started working with combo and ayahuasca. And in the summer of 2019, I actually did a three, three day reset with combo that quote unquote cured me from PMDD. From that day forward, I never experienced anxiety, depression, none of the symptoms, the brain fog, the memory loss, all of it went away just like that. And I'm talking like memory loss so bad that I could be on a call with a client during that two week period and forget their name. And three days of combo gone, poof, completely rewired. Now, at that point in time, I didn't really know about the bioactive peptides and combo and and the job of bioactive peptides is really to teach your cells how to communicate with one another again. So combo is a way of like resetting your body back to a state of homeostasis so that it begins to function the way it's meant to function. So the healing happened holistically in 2019. I also found myself in the Amazon jungle of Peru in 2019. At this point, before going to Peru, I'd sat with um, ayahuasca about seven times. And I did a 14-day dieta with the Shipibo tribe deep in the jungle of Peru in a little town, a little village called Pauyan with um, my maestro, Maestro Papa Gilberto Mahua comes from a very, very revered line of maestros in Peru. And I didn't know what was going to happen at that time. I just went because I wanted to know things. I wanted clarity on my vision, all the things. I was prescribed to diet something called bobensana and noyarao along with ayahuasca. Now, right before, the day before we got to the jungle was the day that my cycle had just finished. Now for the men listening, that means my period. It was the last day of my period. I entered the jungle and about halfway through my dieta, I think it was like on maybe day six or seven, I started bleeding again. And I thought, oh, this is unusual. Maybe I'm ovulating, but then quickly found out it was not ovulation. It was a full blown period. And in my evenings with ayahuasca, every night I'd be in pain laying on my mat. I couldn't even sit up and I could literally feel her working in my womb every single night. And there were nights where I actually saw her hands in my womb space, working my womb. And I was so confused, but I allowed it. And in the jungle is where my my body finally released the fibroids that were in my uterus. I literally experienced and saw them coming out of my body thanks to the potency of plant medicine and, and that space and my maestro support. So after the jungle, I continued working. I I've continued working with plant medicine. I still work with plant medicine regularly and continue to eat whole real foods, continue to drink clean water, continue to move my body almost daily, continue to use holistic practices to heal. And today here I am, you know, in, in, I got COVID and this is just a self-diagnosis by the way, I didn't get tested, never have. Um, but in February, 2021, I had all the symptoms completely lost my taste and smell and for those of you who kind of like doubt that and think it's still, you know, it's, it's kind of like how you lose your taste when you have a cold, bad cold or flu. No, this is completely different. I had no congestion in my nose. So there was no reason for me to lose my taste and smell. I could smell, but I smelled nothing. It was like someone just flipped a switch and I couldn't smell shit 
couldn't taste shit. You could put a, a giant stick of burning sage, which I did in front of my nose and I didn't smell anything. Couldn't taste anything. I had that for about 12 days and healed it holistically. Didn't go to the doctor's office, didn't get tested. It just took all my vitamins, took all my supplements, upped my vitamins and supplements, upped my minerals, upped my rest. Like I just allowed myself to rest on the couch, ate or drank a lot of bone broth, had a lot of fresh fruits and healed. And that to me felt like such an upgrade. I've always believed that after every flu and cold, like, okay, great. Now our body has assimilated this virus or this bacteria. So, so now we're upgraded. Now we're, we're good. That's how I've chosen to look at it. So obviously at this stage in my life, I have a distrust of the medical system because the thing that continues to support me in my healing is holistic practices. It's not the medical system. And by leaning more and more into my holistic practices and into and taking back control of my own healing, I have learned to trust the divine intelligence of my body. Now, my story that I just shared with you today is just one of millions of stories, millions. There, there's so many stories out there. I asked people on my Instagram to share their stories of why they don't trust the medical system. And it was gut-wrenching to hear some of the stories that were shared. I just, I, I, I get emotional thinking about it because so many people are just treated like a number in the system. They're just completely discarded after they've been given their miracle prescription. There's no real aftercare. There's no getting to the root cause. There's no hearing them, like really hearing them, really acknowledging what they're going through from a system that we have been programmed to trust and to obey. It's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, my mom, you know, in 2014 was diagnosed with Wagner's and it's pretty rare. And by the time they found it, it had attacked her lungs and her kidneys, her kidneys were shutting down. They were able to get her lungs back up to about 60%. And I remember being at the hospital and, you know, the, the nurses were great. Everyone was great. Just talking to me individually, but she was put in this systematic um, treatment plan where it just seemed like no one was really able to answer our questions, put on chemo. Why chemo? Well, this, this seems to be the thing that is helping, but we don't know. So she was put on chemo for, for a, something that we weren't even clear about. I remember being there when the nutritionist came in to support her and I was excited. I was like, great, they're going to support her because her kidneys are are low functioning now. She only had one functioning kidney um, and that wasn't even functioning at a hundred percent. And the nutritionist comes in to talk to her and just basically starts reading off of a handout and on the handout, I shit you not, one of the food groups that my mom is told to consume is sugar. That's literally what is written on this handout, sugar. And next to that, there's pictures of candies and cookies. And I look at the nutritionist and I was like, are you shitting me? And he was shocked. (laughs) Of course, maybe he's never been questioned. I don't know. And I was like, you're telling my mom to eat sugar. And he's like, yes, this is to keep her energy levels up. And I was like, that is the most backwards bullshit I've ever fucking heard in my life. He was super shocked. I had him cornered. I was really angry. And then I remembered, okay, this is just an individual who has been indoctrined into this system and is just doing what he's told. And I I let go a little bit. Now, when the, the V's came out for COVID, all of my mom's specialists, we're telling her to get it. Mind you, there have never been any trials on anyone with her condition. And she now has a donor kidney. Okay. 
So she's being told to get it and also pressured to get it because now the doctors won't see her in person. So she gets it. I had another family member who has a heart condition told to get it, bullied into getting it because if he didn't get it, he wouldn't be able to attend his company meetings. Ended up with myocarditis after the first shot. Still pressured into getting the second shot. Ended up getting a major heart attack after the second. This is not acceptable. This medical system that we've been trained and programmed to trust is really a system to keep us sick. Pharma pharmaceuticals is a big fucking business. Okay. So is the insurance company. Now I want to reiterate that the doctors and nurses that are in this system, they're really doing their best. We can't blame them completely. We can't because a lot of them, I mean, think about it. They spend how much money and how many years of their lives devoting themselves to the education that's required to get that uniform. And then perhaps they're the main sole provider for their family or, you know, they have people that depend on them financially. So they're in the system. They're doing their best. Now, again, there have been really brave and fucking courageous doctors and nurses that have left their posts and left their jobs during this time. And for, to those of you, like, I salute you. I honor you. Thank you. Thank you for taking a stand against what you feel is right. The system treats the symptom, not the root cause. And that's what we have to remember. We have all been trained to dismiss our inner knowing. And yes, that is changing now. And I'm so grateful that this is finally fucking changing. But we have been trained to dismiss our inner knowing, to disconnect from our bodies. Just think about all the prescriptions that disconnect us from our bodies. And the prescriptions specifically that I'm talking about are all the antidepressants, the anxiety pills, all those things, they could disconnect you from your bodies. We've been trained to lose faith in our body's ability to heal. Now, many people continue to trust because they've never been given a reason to not trust. Okay. You have to remember that instead of blaming, pointing the finger, making fun of uh, making derogatory comments towards sharing stupid memes about like, stop. These people continue to trust the system because they've never been given a reason to not trust the system. Whereas people like me, we've learned to not trust. What you also have to remember is that people will always choose what's best, what they feel is best for them. People will always choose what they feel is best for them to keep them safe, to help them feel secure to keep them healthy. So we can have two people standing side by side, both who say they value health, both who say their number one value in life is health. And yet these two people could approach it completely different. One could say that the vaccine is what's going to help keep them healthy. And the other could say holistic practices are what keep them healthy. We have to be able to see that to begin healing this fracture in humanity. Because again, this isn't about convincing everyone. This is about bringing it back to a place where we can just do what's best for ourselves. I trust myself over the system. I trust the divine intelligence of my body. And I know I'm not alone in this. I've healed everything. I have, and I continue to heal myself through clean food, through natural spring water, through movement, through breath, through supplements, through holistic practices and sacred plant medicines, I continue to heal myself. And that feels fucking empowering. Since when have we as humanity accepted being told what's best for us in our bodies? It's time to shift that. Let it be a choice. I mean, think about it. Why is only one side of the narrative being censored right now. Now, hating doctors and nurses is not the answer. Okay. It's not. 
our system is breaking. We're seeing it break right now. We're seeing the fractures. We're in the midst of the fracture. The only way out of this is to continue sharing stories despite censorship, despite the fear of being shamed or canceled or deleted. We need to come together and continue sharing stories like this, continue having conversations like this without attachment to to changing someone else's mind. We need to share com- share stories like this and have conversations like this with the intention to share, not to convince, not to persuade. We as humanity need to continue taking a stand for our freedom to choose what's best for us and our health, whatever that may be. Deep breath. Coming back into the heart center, deep inhale. And exhale. Coming back to that place of center of truth, of compassion, of love for ourselves, for all beings, knowing that we are on this journey together. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Potent Truth where I'm taking you on a journey to challenge illusion and lead with sovereignty. If you want to continue to dive into conversations like this, I invite you to join my Awaken Aware community on Telegram. Just head to rubyframon.com forward slash Telegram. And of course, if you have yet to grab a copy of my book, Potent Leadership, just head to potentleadership.com and grab yours today. You can also download Potent Leadership on Audible. It is, it is an amazing book. And I, it's like a year later, I'm learning to like really say that out loud. And I really strongly believe that every leader needs to read this. So please grab your copy today and be sure to leave a rating and review on Audible and on Amazon. Those ratings and reviews really help me out and get this book out to more people around the world. And as for the podcast, you can help me out here as well. Just download a few episodes of Potent Truth and drop a rating and review on iTunes to help get this podcast out to more listeners around the globe. You can also connect with me on social media. My handle is at I am Ruby. If you like getting text messages, you can text hashtag Potent Truth to 1781-336-0160 to start receiving weekly potent reminders. I just want to thank you for all your support with the podcast and all your support with the book. If you have a copy of my book, please be sure to share photos, screenshots of you with the book and tag me at I am Ruby and use the hashtag potent leadership for a chance to get featured. And finally, make sure you check back on Monday for a brand new episode of potent truth. Aho leaders.